Welcome to the Intercut Podcast, the weekly show going over the TV, movies, and entertainment that people can't cut away from. I am your co-host, Zachary Shevich, and joining me, his toes froze off somewhere outside the Mark Theater, it's Arturo Zurita. Ah, how y'all doing? Post it up in this prestigious Sundance <laughs> resort right here, as you can see with these mountains. <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, so still, still stuck like the out here. The festival is completely over. There is just like a couple screenings for the locals. I'm gonna pretend to be the only Mexican who lives in Salt Lake, Mormon City, Utah, and try to sneak <laughs> myself in there tomorrow. But it's been a fun festival. Awesome. Staying up late, and uh, yeah, it's been dope. Been pretty good. Nice. Yeah, uh, we're glad that we get to catch up with you while you're out in Sundance. Obviously, Art is not at his usual a lo- it's a little, filming it's a location with here. his usual beautiful. Background, although it's a very beautiful no background Chicago in its Bulls own right. The, uh... <laughs> uh, so yeah, he's out in Utah for the Sundance Film Festival. We'll be talking about a lot of those releases on today's show. We'll also be talking about Oscar nominations Ooh. in detail because those came out last week, and there's so much to discuss to say. that we can't waste your time. We're skipping the what we've been watching and getting right into a special Sundance edition of yay or nay with our resident Park City dweller. So Art, how cold has it been out there? Dude, it's been freaking hot. I've got an a tan. <laughs> I landed with- Unexpected I land, right? <laughs> went to Salt Lake City, ended up in a freaking pool outside. No, I came here with six jackets. <laughs> it was snowing in Chicago. Came here with six jackets all on top of another to get them to the airport. I have been using the thinnest field jacket possible there was a blizzard in the middle of it it got things cold but literally this morning there were kids outside skateboarding in shorts oh lucky so glo- last year was much colder last I think, year was right? freezing cold but since then global warming became a thing just <laughs> right. started in 2017 we didn't know about it we didn't know. nobody was knew, knew no about one it. told us <laughs> <laughs> wish oh, somebody would tell us about ridiculous. it ridiculous all right Uh, So let's get into our Sundance edition of Yay or Nay. The Sundance Awards came out earlier today, the day we're recording, Sunday, and there's a lot of really exciting stuff to talk about. A lot of movies that I know Art managed to see. I don't know if it was just some sneaky maneuvering or if you had a little insight into what would get these awards. I knew everything that was going to win, man. I'm manipulating the system. I came last year, they (laughs) said, how what could we do different? I said, have these movies. I'm... They won because I'm the one who got them in the festival to begin with. <laughs> they don't care about me. No, they don't care now. about You go to one press screening yeah. and it's... Yeah, it's... they're listening to me while I'm giving them thousands of dollars on merchandise and tickets. <laughs> uh, no, I try to say just... I try to watch as much as I can. I, I like watching all the ones in the narrative competition. I try to watch anything that hasn't secured a release date because I don't know when I'm going to be able to see it or, or when it's going to be released. Exactly. So just try to catch as many as you as you can and eventually, you know, one of them's bound to win something. <laughs> And hopefully it's your favorite, so. So uh, the big prize of Sundance Awards, the U.S. Dramatic Mm -hmm. Competition Grand Jury Prize, was awarded to The Miseducation of Cameron Post. This is a movie coming out with Chloe Grace Moretz, uh, written and directed by Desiree Arcavin. Art, uh, I know we talked about it a little Mm. bit before the fest, but yay or nay, was this a worthy winner of the Grand Jury Prize? Bro, it is in my top ten. It's actually I, my top five. I think I have it at number five. I don't care about numbers. My my six, right? If I'm look, talking about like the movies in particular that have all just blended together in, it, in their greatness, there's six movies that I just can't wait to see again, can't wait to buy, can't wait to recommend, can't wait to just experience it with others. The Miseducation of Cameron Pros is one of those. Uh, it is... The, the festival awards have been a bit weird in where, like, in the recent years, they haven't really blown up as much. You know, there's controversy with Birth of a Nation. Right. Uh, but, but before that, you know, a lot of the times it's like Whiplash. Whiplash is one of my favorite movies. And there was this trend going on right. with the uh, uh, the audience and the jury one being, like, the same movie. And then it, like, trickling and, and, and picking up. Me and Earl, Earl and a Dying Girl. Exactly. Uh, so this past year... Which uh, last year was my first Sundance Film Festival. What one was I don't feel at home in this world anymore. Yeah. Which not only went nowhere on Netflix because it just got dumped there and like very few people saw it. I personally didn't even think it was like incredible. So if we're talking like it, for me, it, in terms of the quality right. between the other movies, it's sort of like I'm expecting this quality. Okay, I'm expecting. Okay, wow, you guys are always bringing, always bring. 
the heck is this? <laughs> right? Now, right. I did like Crown Heights, which the won the Audience Award. Um, and I haven't seen the Audience Award for this one, which I know we'll get to in a bit. But uh, I'm not saying that it takes away from it. But what I'm saying is that Cameron Post, I think, makes up for the slump from last year. And I really hope, I don't know who picked it up, but whoever picked it up, the biggest thing is distribution and who you can get to see these movies. Again, it is in my top six. This year is a bit different from last year and where it's the movies that... Last year was more like these these crazy big hits. Here it's more about these very, very, very solid movies. And there was a lot more of those than there being one clear front runner. And The Miseducation of Cameron Pearls is one that you have to check out. Um, I'm forgetting her name. And she even liked my tweet about Desiree it. Desiree Arcade. No, no, no. The actress who was also in... American, American Heights, Sasha Lane. She needs to be in, be in more things. I... I now see what y'all were talking about awesome. in American Honey. And I'm like, okay, American Honey's a good movie. She's going with her thing. I couldn't tell how much of it was just, you know, the improvisation that you just had to do. Bro, she is good. She right. needs to be in more things. Her banter is fantastic, especially with Chloe Grace Moretz. The directing is great. Uh, the kid from Super Dark Times is in this, and he has the best scene in the movie, in my opinion. Um, awesome. Yo, we were talking uh, as well earlier about going into movies where the director didn't really impress you with the previous one. Right, I was a bigger fan of appropriate behavior than, I than was, you yeah. were, but I think we both thought it was kind of okay. I think I had hopes that her next movie would be better. That's exactly though. what you kept telling me. So I was like, "All right, I'm gonna go into it completely." You know, it's a brand new movie. Let's see what they have to offer. Went from okay to excellent. This is a, a fantastic movie, and a lot of people I already know are wondering: Is this just winning because it's gay? Is this just winning because it's covering <laughs> this? It's about. Uh, it takes place in 1993. A group of teenagers who are, who are all sent to gay conversion therapy camp, and oh man, I know that there is going to be. I personally think it handles both sides. Obviously, they're favoring one side, but they look at both sides. Yeah, in I a mean, certain you know, I think that that you can sit several people down to watch this movie, and some people are going to see one thing, and some people are going to see another thing, and I think that's a good thing. But uh, like all the movies distribution is going to be the biggest part of it. I don't know who picked it up, but depending on how they distribute it, that's going to be the biggest deal when it comes to it. Because this movie is funny. This movie has heart. This movie mm -hmm. has a, a lot of the, the drama parts all just completely down to a T. But the biggest issue is going to be like, are you going to be able to get the right audience to see it? Are they going to play off the fact right. that it's like kind of looking down at this, this church practice and noticing that, you know, they may not have been the best things. Uh, that was a point that I was going to get to of how even if you're super religious or you're like the gayest person ever, I'm pretty sure both sides can see that this this just didn't work. You know what I mean? This thing right. that was happening in the 90s right. just didn't work. And uh, that, that's what the movie's covering. It's not saying don't believe in Jesus. It's just saying don't hate somebody to the point that you're causing them to hate themselves and it can push them to do something that they shouldn't and hurt themselves even more because you're telling them that they're nice. not worthy of it. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it blows up. Yeah. And that sounds like a good message for a movie yeah. like that too. <laughs> uh, so I, I know one movie that you haven't had a chance to see yet, yeah. although I know you're trying to tomorrow. see it tomorrow, is the winner for the audience mm -hmm. award, uh, Burden. So uh, Art, what have you been hearing about Burden at the festival? Burden I've heard since I haven't seen it is that the best part about it is the performances. And a lot of people saying that it's very heavy-handed on a certain side. I won't know until I see it tomorrow, but that's what I've heard. A lot of people praising the performances rather than that. And the other people saying that the reason it won the Audience Award is because it plucked at something that caused people to go like, this is what I need to vote for. When I personally think that other winners did it a lot better. Again, I haven't seen Burden yet, but it, it is one of those cases this year where a lot of it, and I get it, it makes sense, and I'm okay with it when they're good movies. But it was funny hearing some people come out. There's like this white dude, this white older dude. What have you seen? Well, I've been trying to see the most non-offensive movies. And there's like five of them at this festival. Yeah, uh, there is that thing of so, the audience award winner sometimes going to a movie that's maybe a little bit more manipulative and uh, broad. I'm not I'm saying not, I, it is. You haven't seen I, Burden. We're, we're not yeah. talking about Burden. We're talking about generally what happens to... I mean, I mm -hmm. remember being at TIFF one year uh, when The Imitation Game was the audience award winner and you know that's just not really a movie that i think is 
a good example of the quality of films that come through a festival like Toronto, but it is a uh -huh. movie that has that kind of very like emotional ending that kind of is rousing in a way and makes you feel like you're watching something important. And you can imagine if you're in the audience and you know you're the per first person to see this movie, you want to like, you know, vote with your audience ballot and give it that yeah. five out of five. A lot like, of people sometimes, I think, at these festivals get swept up in the moment and, and want to make a statement with the movies they see. Fever Fest, what we were talking about earlier, where that whether you see a movie and you're like, oh, you're so into it. A bunch of the midnight movies that we saw, you could tell like the people were just so excited, either because they were completely drunk or it was midnight, whatever it was. They were yelling at just scene location changes. Whoa, we're in a room now. Like They right. just go completely crazy. So, I mean, I don't know. I'll see you tomorrow. Maybe, maybe it ends up becoming my favorite. Yeah. I don't know. The award for directing went to another movie that I know you haven't seen. It went to Sarah Colangelo for The Kindergarten Teacher. Now, uh, you did see the movie that this one mm -hmm. is based on. Uh, it's based on a 2014 yeah, Israeli out there. film also called The Kindergarten Teacher. Uh, how, what's the buzz been like on The Kindergarten Teacher? Everybody keeps saying that her performance Maggie is fantastic, Gyllenhaal. which is the reason why you, yeah, why you watch a remake to begin with to see what it adds to mm -hmm. it. Uh, obviously, it's in English; it's going to be more digestible for a lot of people. I didn't see it mainly because I knew the story and I wanted to catch new things that I haven't right. seen the story of. So, main buzz has been the acting. I'm surprised with the amount of buzz she got. Why she didn't win actress? Or I think they just do actor, right? For Sundance, it's not actor, actress, it's just yeah, actor. Yeah, they do like one acting award and it didn't go to her. Okay, yeah. So I guess it wasn't that <laughs> much for the jury to vote her in, but that that's the main thing that I've heard from it. Uh, the screenwriting award went to Christina Ko Cho, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, for Nancy. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you saw this one, but Absolutely you are not, not as no. big of a fan of Nancy. Bro, I'm going to name you like five movies. I, I think this these awards are only for the ones in the competition, yes. right? Yes. Like, for the narrative, dramatic yes. competition. I right. First of all, Monsters and Men, better. Sorry to bother you, so better. Let me, let me, Sorry to I bother you, it's you and freaking say insane. The Outstanding First Feature Award did go to Ronaldo Marcus Green for Monsters of Men and Men. That man deserves everything. I'm going to get to okay. him. He's dope. Uh, eighth grade. I would give it to the dialogue in eighth grade. There's a specific scene uh, that, to me, calls back to Michael Stolberg's scene Interesting. in Call Me By Your Name. It, with the same type of emotion of a father to their child. Ca again, like I said, Cameron Post dialogue in there. I know not everyone likes blind spotting. Th that was like probably the ones where people came out going, what the heck? And other people were like, yeah. Sorry to Bother You was also very much like that as well. But I thought that was at least way more innovative. Nancy is more in the performances than it is in the script, in my right. opinion. And if you've seen The Imposter... <laughs> You've seen a much better real life version of Nancy anyway. So I don't know. So yet you think it would have been better off going to uh, Bo Burnham for eighth grade, maybe? A thousand percent. The way Bo Burnham wrote eighth grade, the way that Cameron Post was written, heck, the way the tale was written. Honestly, the way the tale was written, I would love to see how that script was made just because of the way that it's narratively told where she's not having flashbacks, she's arguing with her flashbacks. <laughs> interesting right so exactly so how, i don't get how nancy gets it and not something that's innovative like that not something like sorry to bother you which is completely bonkers okay maybe not sorry to bother you because of how crazy it gets at the end but I, it, monsters and men to me is structured very much like um the story of fathers and sons ryan gosling bradley cooper uh place uh place beyond the pines place oh, between yeah the place pines, beyond the pines. pines between the place Place Beyond the Pines. To me, it's a lot like that in where it's it's each story happens due to like because a of the other one. Kind of. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't see what Nancy has to do. Not, I ain't hate Nancy. I don't want to say that. It's one of those scenarios where Just sort of like, not necessarily I want to hate on you. enough for that prize. Exactly. Especially when other ones outdid themselves in my Yeah, opinion. screenwriting in particular, Fair you enough. think it Whatever. maybe would go to something that's a little more inventive. Uh, than uh, what I've been hearing about Nancy. But yeah, well, you, good for them. They want it. They want you it. You seem like nay on the screenwriting decision for Nancy, but a big yay on outstanding first feature going to Monsters and Men. My man. When we were, we got waitlisted for mm -hmm. Monsters and Men, right? And I'll say this. I apologize because there was Monsters and Men and Monster 
it's like the same synopsis like i said they're at a bodega they see a cop shoot a black dude i was like is this the same movie i wanted to see monster which is actually based off of a book but i had never read the book and mainly because that one starred um asap rocky (laughs) And Nas. And they got Nas acting like freaking Red from Shawshank Redemption. Nas plays the old black wise man at the prison who's got to help this kid out. And that was the original one that I wanted to see. I did not care for that one at all. I feel like the problem with that one, in my opinion, is that it works better as a book. Because the book, I believe, seeing from the movie, is supposed to be written as a script. Because the kid is a Mm -hmm. filmmaker who then gets stuck in the situation. So he's always saying, like external courtroom yeah right so seeing that in the movie it's sort of like yeah i know we're watching (laughs) it i I can see that we're outside and when we're in the interior excuse me monsters and men the one i almost skipped ended up becoming top five movies for me at sundance i was riding with it then the man comes out and he talks and it the movie was like, here, the moment he talked about it, it went through the roof. When we were in the waitlist line, which if you don't know, at Sundance, you have your super, super rich people or your press who just walk in with a badge, the people who have bought their tickets and are waiting in line, and then the people who are waitlisted and they're just waiting to get in, you know, they, they got their little number that they did on the on the online waitlist, and they're just hoping to get in if they can find seats. Well, we're one of those people who are waiting there at 8, eight o'clock in the mm-hmm. morning, right? We're super tired because last night, the night before that, we saw a midnight screening to blind spotting. Ends up ending up like at yeah. two, right? The director was at the screening of blind spotting. Oh, nice. Because he really wanted to watch that movie. He watched it, stayed up late, knowing that he still needed to be there in the morning. And again, doesn't need to be there because you go to some screenings and they're like, yeah, the, the people aren't here. Are they not at Park City? No, they're at Park City. They're probably just like hungover. <laughs> this dude watched blind spotting to go support the movie. Then woke up in the morning again to come to his movie, but went into the waitlist line to let everybody know that he was gonna make sure they got in to see the that's movie. Awesome. I mean that. Now well, look, I, I, I want to say that like that, that sounds like an awesome experience. That has no effect yes. on what I'm going to experience when I watch the movie. What is what's gonna exactly. be like when I sit down and watch Monsters and Men? Bro, this, so the movie starts off. You're following uh, Philip from Hamilton. And then you're, you're following um, uh, a black cop who's dealing with the repercussions of what happened in the first arc. And then the last arc is about a kid and what he's going to decide to do knowing that he can either protest with them or not. And the way they handle some subjects had me second-guessing stuff. Like my idea of how to solve some things, I was – the movie has a bunch of scenes where it's two people – on two different ideologies, right? Was that cop right or was that cop wrong? And they go at it. And usually, right, there's a bias, Yeah. right? <laughs> you're watching the movie and you're going, clearly you're making the one person on whatever side you don't agree with act really dumb. Bro, both sides are stacked to the point that the it's scene just has way. to end with one of them walking away. Exactly. It comes out later. There's a scene between a father and a son and the father and the son are arguing, don't protest because you're going to ruin your college chances. Trust me, th- things will change in the future, but son, I want you to make it. And the son's going, but I don't want to grow up and not have done anything. So now you're sitting there going, damn, what do you choose? Because you can see both yeah. sides. And, and the director comes on, he just start, starts talking about how he just wanted to start a discussion. And he starts a discussion with this movie. He starts a discussion with this movie a lot better than, forget this year, previous years have tried to cover with it. I think it does it better than Fruitvale Station. I think it does it better than... Again, I made a video about how a movie can draw a better discussion than arguing with someone who you're just saying, I don't right. agree with you. But in a movie, you're seeing that police officer's life. You're seeing the man who got shot and the people in his neighborhood and how they live their lives. You're seeing both sides of the stories play out. And I think the three-act structure was fantastic and the way that they were all connected, showing you that one incident isn't isolated. It ripples down. And then him coming out and saying, you know, he's like, I disagree with a lot of people. I had him in the movie. <laughs> like, like the police officers who he said inspired conversations. Police officers, I think he said his dad was a police officer growing up. A bunch of the people who you would think he was just going to speak negative of were not just influenced, but in the movie itself. And I think it was, it's, it's one of the best movies at Sundance. 
Really happy he got it. He's a dope dude. He's awesome. I want to see more stuff from him. Awesome. Uh, so the only other major award that went to a movie I know you haven't seen yet is the special jury prize going to, I think we're alone now. Uh, what do you think about that? What have you been hearing about it? I'm pretty sure you said that you're trying to see that one tomorrow. Tomorrow as yes. well, yeah, they have it playing. Uh, I, I, all I heard was, it looks good. I don't like when people cryptically don't give something, like you can see someone going, eighth grade really got to the, to the heart of what it was to really be an eighth grader and Bo Burnham and the way that he really just tells the story and strips it down to his core and start naming you scenes and start telling you the emotions and they start like releasing their own eighth grade pictures. <laughs> then they get to this one, they're like, the cinematography was spectacular, very pleasing to look at. And I'm like, uh, y'all don't want to talk about story? Yeah, that's it. Y'all don't want to talk that's about it. this? You don't, yeah. And then you'll get the other people who are honest and they're like, nah, it was straight up boring. Yeah. Cinematography is good. And I'm saying cinematography is good. So I'm not surprised at all that it won cinematography because supposedly it's fantastic. If I am not mistaken, it was a female cinematographer? Uh, I'm not sure I about could that, be wrong. Potentially, yeah. But that is the one thing that I, compl I, I heard over and over again that it looks great. Obviously, I was excited. Uh the name is based off of a song that always reminds me of 10 Chlorophyll Lane because that was the last time I heard it. Peter Dinklage. Um, Elle Fanning, I think, so, I think yeah. isn't it as well? And it's like a post-apocalyptic movie. I want to see that. And then they're like, no, literally, that, that's just, they just chill. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see how it is. And hopefully it looks as great as the award says it's supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, and by the, time, time, by the time this podcast is posted, uh, Art will have posted his thoughts on the ATZ show's Twitter as well as his letterbox. So check the description down below for links to both of those. Uh, make sure to check out his thoughts and like them, retweet them. You can hear more about all of his thoughts on all the Sundance movies there. Uh, let's get on with the awards. Achievement in acting went to Benjamin Dickey in the movie that I know you just saw, Blaze. Uh, yes. How do you feel about mm -hmm. that prize going to Benjamin Dickey? Uh, I'm trying to look at the other ones because I just saw it fresh off. And at first when it started, I was like, all right, this dude is just... The character of Blaze is one of those dudes who like speaks mm -hmm. in quotes. So when you're playing a character like that, it feels like an impression almost. But that's just the way the guy talks. Like he speaks in quotes. He says like, you know, the night is darkest when this happens. Uh, you know, confidence <laughs> is like life. And life is like confidence. Like he just says things like that. So you're like, okay, is this just like a cheesy performance or is this right. the character? I think it deserves it. It was actually pretty good. You got to think of the fact that the people who voted it in are actors. So they would know sure. what to look for, in my opinion. Is it a I, bit more I, of a subtle I performance than I think we sometimes see getting awarded with acting awards? So you're seeing him, like, I want to say in a five-ish, maybe ten-ish year span. Oh, interesting. So you start noticing little things. And it was like by the... You know, the beginning of the third act, I was like, all right, I see why you won it. He's able to transform from this guy who mumbles parables to just straight up mumbling <laughs> nonsense. And the way he's able to deliver it, I think, excuse me, uh, I, I would see the, to me, I would have given it to probably Laura Dern for the tale. But I yeah, but I think the amount of. Um, coverage that he does on just this one man's life, the physicality of it. At a certain point, I couldn't take him super seriously because he kind of looked like Post Malone. <laughs> he has like Post Malone's like <laughs> scruffy hair. Um, but I do think he deserves it. He, he, there's a physicalness to it because the character has a limp. There's the way that he talks. And once you get used to the fact that it's like, oh, okay, this is like the character. Right. This, this is literally how he speaks. It's not like a person making an impression, trying to be like, Oh, you're here now? Like trying to sound like an old blues totally. singer. Um, I think it was. I think he did a fantastic job. Uh, so I know that your favorite movie of Sundance so far also picked up award. It is the Next Audience Award. That went to Search. Boy. You want to tell us a little bit about Search Art? Look, I tell this people. I say this all the time. A lot of people like to say, "No, you're just on the high <laughs> train. You're just on this." I'm like, look, Hereditary. I, I. I think it's fantastic. I will keep talking about it, but I didn't say it was my favorite, right? Uh, I went to go see Sorry to Bother You. Blew me. I want to see Sorry to Bother You again so bad because of how 
I, Man, I, maybe we'll talk after the show. You sent me a gif after it. I, I, I got yeah, word of how yeah, good it was. I know you don't mind spoilers. I ain't ruined anything for any of you because I, I don't know what can be in the trailer. It's so insane. But I ain't, I ain't post anything. I saw Cameron post, speaking of. And I ain't say anything until I'm sitting there at search. And the first five minutes go on. And I kid you not, it is the equivalent to Up. When everyone's always talking about, oh, the, the, the visuals in Up are so great because without words, the first five, ten minutes give you this whole story of happiness to sadness. This movie does that in the first five to ten minutes. It's all told on a computer screen. I've heard people say that it's gimmicks. They're lying, thieving adulterers at heart who love gimmicks in other movies. They, I think because Unfriended took place... Yeah, on a it's computer not going to be the first People time that a movie it. has done this, but it seems like a unique take on it. Yeah. It's like people are saying, it's like, oh, I hope this gimmick goes away, you know, just like the found footage horror, found footage gimmick went away. And I'm like, but there were some good found footage movies as well. If you're not willing, to, like, you don't have to like found footage. I understand that. But to say that automatically, anything found footage right. cannot be good. Then yeah, I feel like you're saying the same thing again. Some people have said take away the gimmick of the of the thing, and no one would care about this. Movie. Would you talk? Like I, I was thinking of the story and some similar ones, and how those have gone in pretty far. I'm not gonna spoil anything that happens in the movie, but I'm like, what are you talking about? Take that out. You still got a pretty solid story. Heck, a mini series, if anything, as well. I would say. Um, the way it's told allows it, like I said, instead of it being a miniseries, to be this short thing because the computer screen allows you to have notes and messages that you look through to be able to get a quick recap of things. I think it's edited to perfection. Though saying it's not cinematic, it definitely is cinematic. The, the camera within itself is still on the computer screen, but it still finds a way to, like when they're doing a FaceTime call, to zoom in on the right. FaceTime call, to go out. Like it There's takes still cinematic liberties. decisions Does being some made. Things 1,000%. Yeah. Are there still a couple dumb things? Yes, no doubt. There are things where you're like, why is this computer not closed? Why would he still be on here? Yes. But when someone does something so well, those end up just becoming little minor right. things. I will mention them most definitely, but if that's what's going to like kill it for you and you're going to ignore all this other incredible stuff they keep talking about, it, I like going into a movie and you know, you're always hearing about the producer, the actors. The way that everyone, like the director and the producers have all given the credit to the editors and how much work. I don't know. To me, it's like it shows. It shows it in the movie, like how much effort they put into making it all make sense because you're, you're – I'm looking at my computer screen right now with, you know, you're on it, all my files, audition, you know, the Google Hangout, all these things. And it's like it can get cluttering. So for them to have been able to make sure that it all makes sense – it's fantastic. I think there's a nostalgia to it going back to the Windows 95 that they freaking opened at the beginning of this movie <laughs> to your emails, to your parents snooping around. It's awesome. it's great. It's my favorite of the year. For I'm really reason. excited for it. And uh, John Cho finding his way into some really interesting indie films in the last couple years. Lastly, the next Innovator Award. It was split between two movies. I don't think you saw Night Comes On, but Cheating. I know you saw... No, I didn't see that one, yeah. Uh, we the Animals. I saw a lot yes, of stuff on Twitter praising We the Animals, talking about it maybe being this year's Moonlight. Art, can you tell me a little bit about it? Bro, there's some movies you go into in the next category. And the next category to me literally just means... Um, this idea is so crazy, we can't put it in the narrative. <laughs> it, it, this this movie uh, does things differently. I won't say weird. It does things differently that people are not going to be used to. There was a lot of ones that came up. Um, Madeline's Madeline. A lot of critics really, really like. They've already said that it's going to be their favorite movie of the year. For me, We the Animals not only embraced me in its differentness in telling the story and how visual it was, Right. A lot of people have compared it to the Florida Project and Moonlight. A lot of, you know, it's like, you really got to compare things? You should. It's not bad. Because what you're saying is that Moonlight and um, the Florida Project have set the bar for that type of storytelling. And in my opinion, it's better than the Florida Project. I'm not going to say it's better than Moonlight, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you like the Florida Project, there's absolutely no way you don't love we the animals. Interesting. This thing just... I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it. 
I know it's not going to be for everyone because it's not one of those beginning, middle, end with a plot and a climax. They are there. There's always there. When people say, oh, the movie has no story, there is a story. There, uh, Florida Project has no story. It is. It's about a little girl walking around. Yeah, but when I say story, I mean explosions. Yeah, no, no, no. That's not <laughs> right. it. But there is a story where you're following this individual. And for this one, it's it's a little boy. He's one of three siblings. You saw Atypical? Yes. You know the bartender in Atypical? I did. Who's also an easy? Yeah, 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 yeah. That man's going places. He's the dad in this movie. That oh, man, sorry, I was first. watching him. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm talking about him. That that guy. He is in this. This dude is going to be the next, um, I said, Luis Guzman. Which, yeah. Because I really like Luis Guzman, but I know you're going to be like, <laughs> Luis Guzman, how dare you offend him? All right. I mean, he's the next big Hispanic character actor akin to your boy who was just in Rogue One, who's in the Heineken commercial and everybody thinks that he's freaking uh, Banderas, Antonio Banderas. Um, (laughs) Now I'm blinking on his name. Benicio. Benicio del Toro. This man is going to be the next Benicio. I'm telling you this right now. Seeing him in Atypical, I'm like, this dude's got a presence. Like in Atypical, I thought he had a big presence. Like that dude wasn't just a bartender. He got those big old gritty teeth. Uh, an easy, completely different side, a mm-hmm. vulnerable side to him. Yeah. In this one, his best performance to date that I've seen him in, like by far, because this is a movie. This this man is the kids, the visuals, the transitions that are done through paper. I think it's based off of a book. I haven't read the book. It is. There's there's not talking really in this movie. Of like two, I mean, there's there's dialogue, mm-hmm. but it's in how the kid writes his journals. It's the, it's the way the kid looks at things. Wow. What the camera decides to point at. I don't want to be cheesy and say it's magical, but it's one of those movies where if you give into it, it gives you back. The director has said, I, I hope this movie means something special to you. I hope this movie means something to you because it means everything to me. And I was like, all right, let's check this bad boy out. And it's just like, yeah. He, he gives it his all. Just like just like The Florida Project, just like Moonlight, right? But in my opinion, there's just something about this movie that worked a lot more. And I think it was the subtlety. Imagine the first part of Moonlight for an entire feature film. Awesome. Him not growing up. I, I don't mean to... Again, I'm not saying that it's better than Moonlight. Yeah, I'm saying it's better yeah. than The Florida Project. Just for descriptive clarity. But it, he had mentioned, and I haven't read the book, but he had mentioned that the book ends with him being 18. Not in, you know, his childlike stage because at 18, then they were able to show him mature, excuse me, um, into his sexuality, I'll say. And they said 18 was the best way to show that, right? Because it was more of a legal thing. And he's like, no, that's like in the last two chapters. If I show that, then you have a disconnect. And I was like, you may be onto something here because I know... One of the very few complaints for those who didn't like Moonlight is that you go, you get attached to one kid, then it's a completely different actor than a completely different actor. And I liked what he was saying, again, not bashing Moonlight, but that idea of keeping one character and following the whole journey through the one actor. And I think that's what really helped it out. Not just jumping forward in time and it's like, oh, okay. I mean, I get that that's the same guy, but you know, as an audience member, you're gonna be like, but he looks a little bit different. He doesn't look as adorable as Little did. This guy's a little bit more fierce, right? Yeah. No, seeing just the kid and coming to his maturity, the way that the story is told, like I said, I think I was surprised. When I had asked on Twitter, I said, yo, what should I watch? A lot of people said, we the animals. And I was like, all right, let's go see this. And uh, I know some people are going to find it boring. I know to some people it's not going to work. That's why it's in the next category. But for me, it did. And I'm glad I saw it. Awesome. So uh, those are the major Sundance Awards that we went through. A lot of those are movies that Art has seen, but I know that you had some other favorites. Uh, you mm-hmm. mentioned briefly that you are a fan of Bo Burnham's directorial debut, Eighth Grade. I am. You mentioned that you uh, <laughs> thought Sorry to Bother You was like no movie you had seen. Bro, yeah. It's not. Trust me. It's not. Only way to describe it. Uh, a lot of people were also talking about Hereditary, the latest horror pickup by A24, the studio that's also put out movies like It Comes at Night and The Witch, very divisive horror movies. Uh, Art, this was a big to- hot topic on Sundance Twitter. What did you think of Hereditary? It's not divisive like the other two. This is hands down the best one that they have released. There's no doubt about it. Uh, 
it it's I believe getting released in June. It's got everything that you need. It's a fantastic horror movie, not with jump scares, but it's got the thing that, that, that freaks me out the most. You're looking at the screen, and the shot doesn't change. You just freaking notice something, and why it's so scary is because it was in front of you the whole time. Jump scares are lame. They're literally lame. It's just like someone appears when it's like physically not impossible to not have seen the person standing right here and say, mm-hmm. what the heck? How can you not see the person standing right there? And then it's not even scary. That's why they got to amp up the volume to like scare you. This don't do that. This don't, it doesn't do that. The scary parts have nothing to, like, it's actually quiet when, you're end, when you end up yelling. <laughs> what it is is that, like, you're seeing somebody, and all of a sudden, you, you notice that there's someone, like, in the corner of the room that's been there the whole time, and you just go, what the heck? For those of you who saw it and noticed the librarian, like, in the background, but they don't make notice of it, and that makes it scarier because you're like, but why, but why aren't you mentioning that? That type of scariness in Insidious, in the Insidious movies, when they were still being directed by the master himself, and you would, they would just walk by, and the little boy was just hanging there. That's what we're talking about for two full hours in this movie. There's a thing that happens 20 minutes into this film that you're just like, "What the heck? Did I just see that?" It it takes place on the road. You will know what I'm talking about when I see it. I don't know if that's how they're going to want to sell this movie or not. But you see that and you go, okay, that's it right there. That's what everyone's going to be talking about. By the time the movie ends, four other huge things have happened. (laughs) That you're just like, wait a minute, but that first insane thing blew our minds. And I don't mean like, like, just plenty of great things that happened. I'm talking about there are Four specific shots in this movie. Usually a movie tries so hard to have the one. This one gives it to you at 15 minutes and then goes, yeah, but we got three more to give you. I'm not kidding with you. We're talking like... I I, I thought for a fact that first one was going to be like all the movie had in it. And it said, no, boy, you don't even... No, it goes crazy. This thing is straight up satanic. So watch it with a pastor. Watch it with your youth group, whatever you need to watch it with. It is it is oh, one man. that you actually want to see with a group. It is one that, in my opinion, I think is even going to get some attention down the line because this is some of the best horror performances you have ever seen. It yeah. is so scary. It's funny. A lot of people have been talking about Tony Collette's performance being like the best horror Thousand performance percent. since maybe like the Babadook or something. Mm. That's... It is up there with that performance from the Babadook. And I know a lot of people are going to be sleeping on him, but this movie would be nothing without, I want to say it's Alex Wolf. They put this kid through hell and back. It is insane. I'm talking about not just like a, a scream queen, like, ah, he's got to yell. I'm talking about like they, they, they freak him the heck out. He has to like have this like tra- trauma thing that he's got to do. And then the camera just sits on him. As he shakes for like five minutes, and I'm like, "What did y'all do to this man?" <laughs> First of all, previously he had just played the the, the one of the terrorists in uh, the Boston bombing movie, oh, Patriot's um, Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and now that he's doing this, and I was like, "This, unlike his brother, this kid's choosing the darkest things to go in through. Right. He's gonna get way too scarred." So those two performances are insane. Uh, and Dowd. Ooh. Really good in this movie. I'm not gonna say why. Um, it is a movie that I think everyone should have on their radar. It is fantastic. It is insane. Pick up on all the little details that you have on there, and take a bath or get baptized the moment that ending happens, because it is utterly ungodly. Uh, I'm excited for that one. It, it's mm. been getting such cool reviews. Uh, that definitely seems like every horror nerd is going to want to put that one on their radar. Yes. Um, so I know a couple other movies that you liked. Uh, do you want to talk about The Tale at all? You mentioned that Laura Dern potentially was yeah. one of your favorite acting performances this year at Sundance. Um, the, the, I think she was fantastic in the movie. I think the narrative, the way that they tell the story is fantastic and the way that she's trying to re we look at her past and it's based off like a bunch of little stories that she wrote and she's a documentary a, a documentarian but instead of just like showing you a flashback she'll show you a flashback and then be like but that's not how i remembered it so then they swap out the actress to then be like i oh i thought she was a redhead it turns out hmm. she wasn't a redhead she was blonde so then they re-show you the scenes with the blonde and st- it's cool like i really like that aspect of it then the movie goes to a place 
We just talked about Hereditary. But this is not as bad as the crazy things that happen in Hereditary. Or, or this, I mean, this is worse than the crazy things that happen in Hereditary. Be and it's real. Like it's, it's not played for horror, I'm assuming. It's not played for horror, yet it's way more horrible. Mm -hmm. And some movies insinuate it. They show it. Obviously, it's movie magic. Right. But some people don't know movie magic. And this is that movie that uh, you never want to see again. Oof. It's, a, I, um, it's like the Detroit. It's, a, it's the 12 Years a Slave of this specific subject. You watch it, you go, okay, and you never want to see it again. And while some may disagree about how they show some things, it's one of those things where it's just like, well, you know, Patch of the Christ, they needed to whip them that hard in order to get to the point of that, mm -hmm. right? In 12 Years a Slave, the whippings had to be that hard to get to the point of it, and you have to show it. Same thing with Detroit and the harassment in that movie. With a bunch of these movies that you don't want to see again, certain directors go, we need to show it to you in order for you to get the gravitas of the situation. They showed it to you in this movie. I'm glad HBO picked it up. I don't know if they're going to do a theatrical run with this, but the best place to see it is at home, in the shower, to just wash that away from you because it's it's disgusting at points. But it's it's impacting, very impacting. And that's why I'm surprised Laura Dorn didn't get it with the arc that she goes through in the story. I'm really looking forward to her performance. She's had like a real uh, great run yeah. in the last year the or so. The Dernissance that's happening? Yeah. The Dernissance. <laughs> Full-on Dernissance. Uh, um, and I wouldn't let you get through the segment without telling me a little bit about Nick Cage and Chainsaws in Mandy. Listen, I know all of y'all excited for Nick Cage and Chainsaws. The worst part of this movie is when Nick Cage doesn't show up. <laughs> it's like a two hour movie. He's in it a bit in the beginning, but the first hour, my man's absent. And is it until, as you know, and the poster shows you, he's out for his revenge for his wife. And this is a very psychedelic movie. <laughs> uh, I would, the closest I would say it's, imagine a, a very Nick Cage campy movie, right? But ben uh, oh, Wheatley, I'm imagining. <laughs> but, but Ben Wheatley directed it. Right. <laughs> and it's Nick, Nicholas Wood in reference uh, cinematographer. <laughs> and they all did shrooms before the movie. It's based off of a book, and you can follow along with the book when they give these freaking 10-page monologues to the screen while they have, like, five effects on the screen. I was not the biggest fan of that. <laughs> Some people may really like it. What everyone is going there to watch, and I will tell you it does 1,000% deliver, is the Nick cage isness that happens. There are some fantastic lines dealing with his shirt, <laughs> dealing with a bathroom scene with one of the best freakouts. Um, what I think happened in this movie is that they approached him to play a different character who was supposed to be weird, and Nick Cage said, nah, I don't want that. So then they're like, okay, we have a very serious movie here, <laughs> and we can make that. Or we can completely ruin the vision of this movie and get Nick Cage to then make it something. And they went with Nick Cage. There's two movies happening here. There's this trippy, like, cultish, uh, like, crazy horror movie going on. Then there's Nick Cage doing his straight-to-Netflix zaniness. And he's they clash the together. Scenery, I'm crazy, nuts, Nick Cage. Bar he's yelling chewing at like the bees. barbed wires in this movie, but it is fantastic. My favorite scene is the t shirt scene. He gets mad because someone ripped his t shirt, and the way he reacts to that. Yo, there was like guys, like midnight, guys standing up just uh, clapping like crazy. Oh, man. So, yeah. I'm very excited to see that one. Uh, so for all the fun times that you've had at Sundance, there were a few movies that I know disappointed you. One that I wanted to talk to you about was the movie that got the first big deal out of this year's Sundance when Neon, the distributor behind Itania, picked up Assassination Nation for $10 million. Uh, this is the second film from writer-director Sam Levinson with a bunch of new faces as well as Suki Waterhouse and Bill Skarsgård. Art. Do you understand Neon's big money splash on Assassination Nation? Someone said, Neon's out here picking up the movies A24 don't want. Someone said that. I can't remember where on Twitter. And I said, that's bogus. Shout out to whoever. And, and it's true. I don't, there was no movie at Sundance that I hated. There was one that peeved me, but none of them I hated. So... I thought every movie had something to it. The, the three that I didn't really 
care for so much was Summer of 84 because it didn't really do anything. Nancy, I think I have it a lot lower than it really is. Um, Tyrell, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Assassination Nation, I, I didn't dislike. Again, that was another Midnight movie. Everyone was hyped for it. Everyone was cheering for it. Um, I don't think it fully works as a narrative to which you would say, well, of course, that's a metaphor. So when I look at the metaphor, I'm like, yeah, but that's a stupid metaphor. <laughs> well, it's because it works as a narrative at that point. Yeah, but we just said the narrative is stupid. It's it's a fun, crazy movie. Do not get me wrong. It is. I, I recommend people watching it because there are some lines where you're just like, that was savage. Yo, that was a good kill. That's this craziness. You know, I'm not going to say, like, the, the Purge is an enjoyable movie and not say that this isn't. Where this is practically right. the Purge um, meets, like... Mean Girls, in a sense. It's The Purge meets Mean Girls Interesting. meets whatever hacker movie that just exploits everything out there. It's like, it's like a mini episode of Black Mirror meets Mean Girls, um, where this whole town just ends up going crazy and all the actresses that you mentioned uh, have to stand up for themselves. It's a very feminist tale, and it's funny because it starts off by telling you there's a trigger warning. So I find it very interesting because it's not PC in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. And it does get to, to something by the end of the movie where a character just, like, does a monologue. It ghost stories it. That's <laughs> when a movie's very cryptic, but then they decide to just get a character out there and just tell you what the whole movie's about. Yeah, just sneak that one scene mm. in there in the middle. I thought it was fun. There was just situations where they go from, like, oh, I'm so helpless, to, like, sniper at like, what? No, it's a metaphor about how women can stand up for themselves when they need it. David S. Goyer directed or wrote it, and uh, recently I have not been the biggest fan of David S. Goyer. Yeah, David S. Goyer is a person who I like less when he's actually talking himself yeah. in interviews. Um, but from what I've noticed, he's more of that guy who does the whole "all men need to apologize." Yeah, but this baby was just born, but it was born a male, and it needs to apologize. The what are you talking about? All men have done wrong, and they need to apologize. Like, he's that type of guy. Mm. And noticing some things in this movie, they don't always do it, but they kind of hinted it. And then I remember it's written by David S. Goyer, and I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> I do think it's a fine movie, and I, I think some of the, a lot of the metaphors and the shots that they have are, like, really good, but I'd have to watch it again to really, like, get what they're going at because it gets to a point where it's like, again, what I was saying with a lot of the other movies where it's dealing with police brutality, you know, white cops and black civilians and how it could have swayed one way that most movies were like, nah, we're going to obviously, you know, we're siding for the people who have been hurt, but we're, we're, we're going to really try to see both sides. There was like one nice guy in this movie. <laughs> if I'm a bash, God's not dead. And all the people who like this movie are also going to bash God's not dead movies for making anyone who's not a Christian look bad, right? Then I'm going to have to say the same thing here. A little <laughs> bit. A little bit. Have it both ways. Can't but uh, it no, ways. it's a crazy movie. I still enjoyed it for what it was. It, you cool. know, it's 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 an extreme version. Yeah, so not you terrible. Know, not... Oh no, I don't think. No, 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 no. Not, none of these were terrible movies, other than you're talking about Tyrell. All right, so let's get into it. My boy Sebastian Silva back at it, making people uncomfortable. Uh, his latest is Tyrell, and uh, I think uh, what's his name, Caleb Landry Jones, is in this one. Uh, I Michael like Sarah shows up. Uh, Love him. What did you think about Tyrell? Where did it rub you the wrong way? Hmm. You remember Vincent Adult Man? From our I, favorite from one of our favorites, Bojack Horseman? I've made a business. Wow, I'm so glad you bring that one up, right? He doesn't know what work is. He just knows that he makes a business. Mm. Imagine a little kid trying to talk about something that he has knows nothing about. Imagine a non American trying to tell you what America is like. That, to me, is this movie. I am a big fan of a lot of people who are in here. Uh, dude who's also in Piercing, he was in uh, James White. James James White, or... He was just in It Comes at Night as well. Uh, oh, Chris Abbott. Um, yeah. yeah, Chris Abbott. And then um, uh, Jason Mitchell's in this as well, right? Main reason I wanted to watch this movie. Right. He's, he's, he's Tyrell. Um, you don't mind if I give you a little bit of the synopsis a bit? Go ahead. Tyrell's a story about this black dude who doesn't have room in his house right now, so he ends up going with his friend, who's friends, right? So he doesn't really know the gr- other group of friends, but he knows Chris Abbott, who tells him, yo, they're cool with you coming with us since we know that your house is a little busy right now with all the people you have over. So he's joining this place. He's not forced into it. He's actually being accepted. They're making room for him. And he gets there, and... I have been calling this movie Microaggressions the Movie. 
again, it is an outsider who has no idea how America really works, taking advantage of the fact that there are definitely issues happening in America. But not, I don't know why Jason Mitchell signed up for this. It's called Tyrell because his name is actually Tyler. But at the beginning of the movie, a dude's getting out of the car. And he's like, hey, man, nice to meet you. He's like, Tyrell. He's like, oh, hi, Ty- hi Tyrell. Yeah, it's Tyler. Oh, sorry, man, I didn't hear you. And then the director decides, well, that's it. The movie's Tyrell. But I Look, I would feel you if this was like a racist dude who over and over again kept calling you Tyrell. Well, if it's about microaggressions. bro, Tyrell never gets brought up in the movie ever again. This is what I mean by the first of many microaggressions. I've heard because the guy people, even said, "I'm sorry." I've heard people who enjoyed it more than you on Twitter compare it to Get Out without the horror. Do you see that at all? Why? Because Michael Landry Jones is in it, or Landry, whatever his name is. Yeah, because <laughs> maybe in that. It? No, no, because in, okay, for no, because in Get Out they actually say things that are messed up if you take out the horror, which. For, yeah, take out the horror from Get Out. It's that's the dumbest up. thing. I've, yeah, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, well, we take take the water and the fish out of Finding Nemo too. Yeah, it's, no, you can't take the horror out of Get Out. If you take the horror to Get Out, then it's not Get Out. It's a, that's dumb. Okay, first of all, <laughs> all right. So if we take um, the beast out of Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> it's just like that. No, to me, I, I get what they're trying to say. That it's just like the uh, the ambiance of the room and how people don't really mean what they're saying. But, but they are coming off a little wrong. There's a gay dude in this movie. There's a foreign dude in this movie. Chris Abbott himself, I believe, is Middle Eastern. Why is he taking everything the wrong way? Where He's getting mad for things that aren't even targeted at him. But the funny part is, is that when Michael Sarah finally appears in this movie and he saves it. Because this man comes in and he saves it by saying even more messed up things. But he agrees with Michael Sarah's because he likes Michael Sarah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know, what? man. You're making me curious. I'm curious. About oh this no, no, movie. definitely. I always say, I always say, watch every movie because I'll give Tyrell that. While it's not my favorite, because I was just watching it, going like, this don't make any sense. Like he acts, I, I'm, he acts like he was violated the night before, and all they did was play a game where it's like do an accent, and he's okay with the Chinese accent and the Russian accent, but when it talks about doing a black accent. Well, maybe that's part of his point. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I, I'm curious to check it out. Um, I know another movie that you were a little bit disappointed by is the uh, directorial, the directorial debut of our favey Paul Dano. Uh, this one's called Wildlife. It stars oh. Carrie Mulligan, amongst others. Uh, but it was a bit of a d- disappointment, was it not? Look, I mean, it's one of those things where you wait list so many times for one thing that when you finally get it, I guess your expectations can be high. I still try to judge it, you know, for what it is. And I always wait a bit before I even update the letterbox or whatever else. Talk about it with other people. Let it marinate, if you will. It's good. Mm-hmm. I think it's based off of a book. So then my problem is with the book. It ain't with Paul Dano. <laughs> the only thing I'll give Paul Dano is just like, y'all got to cut some scenes for me. I'm glad he's a very patient director. I, you know, his style is to keep the camera on. But I don't need a dolly in on the kid from the visit to be like a minute long. I get it. He's not liking the scenario. Gotta speed it up a little. Uh, yeah, I gotta speed it up a bit. Same thing with um, the, the characters a bit. Big Jake Gyllenhaal fan. Couldn't wait to come see him for like 25 minutes in this movie before he, before he's gone for just a bit. Just a warning for those of you guys who are really looking forward to that. Just the way that the story plays out. There's a specific character. It's really Carrie Mulligan's movie. Um, just seen through the eyes of the kid. But again, I'm gonna bl- I have to blame the book. I'm not gonna blame blame Paul Dano or, or Zoe Kazan. Uh, I think the production design, the way it looks all fantastic but in terms of the character herself it's sort of like she starts off and you're like wow she's like this very she's very much a housewife and what ends up happening is sort of like what (laughs) like like in we the animals the mom ends up going through something and you see how she reacts but it makes sense here it's like there is, there is, there is you getting a downfall, and then there's you legitimately not caring. Right. Like, like just straight up. I don't know. To me, that transition in the second half didn't work. It's a much slower movie. 
which is fine. But after a while, after the dolly, after the bus, after the like, you know, some people open. I'm of the Edgar Wright. Open the door. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't expect everything to be that fast, but I don't expect everything to be like walking down the hallway. <laughs> Yeah, you got places to be a little bit, a little bit. Got to open the door. And it's not so drastic. There are other ones, like, I would say piercing that does it a bit more. But, um, yeah, that felt like, oh, okay, I get it. Got to extend the story out because it's a very simple tale of a very simple family and what they go through. All right, so this is your second time attending the festival. And Mm -hmm. last year you saw your favorite movie, 2017, Brigsby Bear. Bear. You saw The Indie Darling of 2017, Call Me By Your Mm -hmm. Name. You caught the eventual Oscar nominee, Mudbound. Mm -hmm. Uh, What about 2018? You caught more movies this year than you did at last year's festival. How does this year's Sundance compare to last year's? I agree with what a lot of other people have been saying. There is no huge call me by your name. Brigsby Bear wasn't like this crazy massive hit yeah. either. No whiplash, like, no boyhood. There's no whiplash, no boyhood for for those people as well. I mean, the closest to me was Search. It kind of got me there, mm-hmm. but like Brigsby Whiplash, those movies like stuck with me. Call me by your name as big as it was. Um, I I was thinking Wildlife was going to be this year's big sick and having a duo that are dating each other, mm-hmm. working on the movie and having it get some buzz as well. There is no, like, big sick either, in my opinion. There's not, like, these massive movies that I think people are going to adore as much as, like, previous ones did. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that as a bad thing. Yeah, you seem to have pretty much enjoyed almost everything that you saw, and you've seen a lot of movies. I have greatly liked a lot more movies than I have loved if that makes any sense. Like last oh, yeah. year, I loved Brigsby and Call Me By Your Name. And I, I, mean, I can't remember everything from last year, but I thought the other ones were like, were like good. Here, I think there's a lot of really, really good. We the Animals, to me, is really, really good. Cameron Pulse is really, really good. Monsters and Men, Hereditary, Sorry to Bother You, Search. All of these are really, really good movies. So there's a huge crop of really, really good movies instead of that one that's just like, y'all just gotta be waiting for this. And it, it's still kind of there. Hereditary is that. You know what I mean? Right. To me, search is that. To me, think, I can't wait for people to see Sorry to Bother You <laughs> and who utterly hates it and who loves it. You think Hereditary is going to be the one that most people are talking about when we look back at this year's Sundance? I think it's going to be Hereditary and Cameron Post, but I really hope people give Search a chance, and this all depends on how they put it out there. It, it, that's really it's just going to depend on how they put it out there. Awesome. Uh, I have faith in in eighth grade since A24 is going to be handling that. But yeah, I mean, that's the big deal. It's how they handle it. Awesome. Well, there's a lot of exciting movies to look forward to coming out of the Sundance Film Festival. Make sure you keep up with Art at the ATZ Show, who will be posting about a lot of these movies, I'm sure. Uh, We're going to get into them later, but let's move on to the Oscar nominations, which Mm -hmm. were revealed last week. Uh, It was a pretty exciting crop full of movies that people were really, really enthusiastic about. Get Out showing up huge. The Shape of Water having a Lord of the Rings-like type of uh, nomination streak with 13 nominations. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lady Bird getting into a lot of the major categories, including Best Picture and Best Director. Uh, But there are some snubs that people are talking about with Steven Spielberg, Martin McDonough, and Luca Guadagnino all losing out Best Director nominations. Art, what was your big reaction to the reveal of the Oscar nominations last week? Either y'all agreed with me that James Franco didn't deserve (laughs) his best Oscar nod, or y'all vanity fared him. You heard about that? Yeah. He was in the vanity fair cover and they just cut him out. (laughs) Oh, wait, that I didn't hear about, really? That, yes. We were talking about whether uh, Three Billboards is going to win. Obviously, it was going to get nominated, but have things changed where it may not be the front runner anymore because of the backlash? Right. I don't know, because backlash seemed to have happened that the Golden Globe winner isn't even nominated. Now, trust me, I was the one who said, I don't think he should be nominated. I, I liked the performance, but I don't think it was Oscar worthy, but everybody else did, and all of a sudden they didn't. What has happened in between the allegations? There are a lot of people saying that, uh, you know, maybe it was these allegations around James Franco that kind of knocked him out of the race. Bro, they uh, CGI'd so him sure. out of it. He was I'm in the Vanity so Fair sure cover. They cut him out. I'm not sure how much he was knocked out, though, because it, it was kind of, 
allegations that surfaced in the last couple days of eligibility for the for the voting. I mean, I guess. And, and he's also like he was also kind of like a fringe nominee in the first place. I don't know if he was necessarily a lock, but he did end up uh, losing out to Denzel Washington from Roman J. Israel Esquire, which we was gotta watch not that a movie, movie that a lot of people have seen. <laughs> we got to watch that movie. <sighs> yep. I don't know. I see. I feel like the Denzel one is sort of like, hmm, people really hate us for what who we let win last year. How do we change that? <laughs> People, shoot, we like Casey Affleck one last year. How do we change that? Well, let's get rid of him and swap him up with Denzel. <laughs> it, it, is, it did kind of occur to me that I feel like Denzel is now asserting Meryl himself Streep. as this, like, yeah, he's male Meryl, Meryl Streep or king of Hollywood, especially now that Tom Hanks lost out on yet another great performance between this Captain Phillips, Sully, uh, and The Post. He's now, like, gone several years without getting a Best Actor nomination. It's disrespectful. Nomination. It's disrespectful. We're we not going to mention how disrespectful it is. Do you know when like someone just reaches such a degree that they give you greatness all the time? You take them for granted. You just call them good? Yeah. That's not, that ain't right. Yeah. I mean, it's what we're doing with Meryl Streep, except we still give Meryl Streep Oscar nomination. She got her record 21st nomination, breaking her own record. Um, and another thing that was show, showed up relatively small... Uh, one of your favorites from last year, Call Me By Your Name. It did get a Best Picture nomination. Chalamet did get in to the Best Solo Actor one. race. Solo uh, but look, as I mentioned, Luca Guadagnino was not in the Best Director race. And both Michael Stolbark and yeah. Armie Hammer didn't show up in Best Supporting Actor. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't think Stolberg's role was big enough, even though it literally is supporting in all the sense of the, yeah. of the phrase. What I've heard a lot of complaints about, and I don't know if this is fangirling, but the people who have really been on Army Hammer, what do you think? I don't think so. I mean, I didn't think Army Hammer was that great. That being said, right? like, uh, you know, he was serviceable. No, he did a good job. Yeah, but like, it, so sounds like I'm not a big fan complain. of the uh, Christopher Plummer performance that got nominated. It's fine, but I don't think it's the. Oh yeah, the one that he just <laughs> the one he just filmed last week. Yeah, yeah that exactly. One. <laughs> yeah, I think it kind of makes a little bit of a mockery of the Oscars that he just kind of like stepped into this movie last minute and is able to get a Best Supporting Actor nomination. Yeah. We're not, not even on the animated the category oldest, yet. Yeah. Uh, acting nominee in Academy history. I also don't is know he? if yeah uh, for this performance. Uh, Wait, I also well, don't didn't know he win if, the sorry? oldest one as well? Yeah, he's the oldest winner, and now he's the oldest nominee. He's just breaking his own record Yep, because he's getting older. Uh, and Woody Harrelson, I don't oh. know if he necessarily deserved the supporting actor nomination over either of the Call Me By Your Name guys. Uh, I thought he was really good, but again, Woody he Harrelson kind of had a small part too. No, I think it's just adding to the fuel of the people who didn't want, what's his name? Sam Rockwell. Because... Yeah, Sam Rockwell. So they just going, what, Sam Rockwell and this other guy? It just adds <laughs> to that narrative because now well, they can the add thing. that. It's this weird, not... like, does Three Boards have a lot of momentum because it got the two supporting actor nominations? Or does it have hey. not a lot of momentum because it didn't get the Best Director Award? I mean, I'll point out that Argo won Best Picture a few years ago after you know Ben Affleck did not get the Best Director nomination. Jay-Z got the most noms at the Grammys, went home with nothing, so I don't know what to tell you. Is this bad news for Shape of Water, maybe? Oh, bad news. Yeah, Shape, no, Shape of Water, you said it was like Lord of the Rings, so it gets it on the third try. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the triangle of water will get it. Um, Florida Project was another one I was a little bit see, uh, sad to see. Pretty much entirely shut out. I think its only nomination came for Best Supporting Actor, Willem Dafoe. Uh, I was hoping it would sneak into Best Picture or Best Cinematography, but... Ultimately, mm -hmm. there's just too much competition in there, uh, especially from Phantom Thread, which came up much bigger than people expected. Which you and I were really hoping nominations. for, yeah. yeah. we are thrilled with this. It's the second time that Paul Thomas Anderson has received a Best Director nomination. I'm really happy, uh, not just that Daniel Day-Lewis got in for what we expected would be his mm -hmm. uh, Best Actor nomination, but that Leslie Manville breaks through and gets the yeah, Best like, Supporting yes. Actress nomination. She yes. was so good in that movie. That one scene that she has with her brother where she tells him, like, I will put you... <laughs> that scene alone was just like, yeah, you do belong here. Yes, you do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know... I was worried that not enough people will have seen Phantom Thread, but I'm sure that anybody who did see Phantom Thread remembers that performance. Uh, yeah. And it did so well that I'm honestly surprised we didn't see like a surprise nomination for Vicky Crepes or something. I just don't want to see her again because she scares me. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I feel what you're saying. 
So, uh, is, is who is your biggest snub and best actress? Is it her? Is it Jessica Chastain for Molly's Game? Uh, I think Molly's Game got what? Uh, best script? Screen, screenplay nomination, yeah. Adapted which, screenplay. Which is what it should have gotten. Um, I think Jessica deserved to get in there. Who would you who would you swap for her? I mean, you know, name them, name them. It's always hard to say Meryl because she, she's always good, but it's just and like no. The post was good though. How many I'm, times I'm, do we need to give Meryl another nomination? Yeah, um, I know, but, but but this one was good, right? Yes, yes, it was like really Ricky good. and the Flash, that other stuff. That what those yes. were like. I will argue with you with those, but it's gotten to the point that because you nominated with all those, when she gets a rightfully deserved one, like for the post. You then throw in that narrative of, you know? Exactly. It does complicate things. Um, I mean, and, then, and it's hard because it's a really good field this year. I wouldn't nominate her over Sally Hawkins, Frances McDormand, no. uh, Margot Robbie, Saoirse Ronan. So, yeah, she don't belong there. <laughs> she's six. Yeah. She's Honorable six. mention. Have her, have her announce the award. Yeah. <laughs> except, except in Casey Affleck's <laughs> place. Yeah. Why not? Uh, Logan became the first superhero movie to get a Best Adapted Screenplay nomination. Uh, what do you think about Logan making this breakthrough? I think for all of you who said, wow, you're so pathetic for having a superhero movie in your top ten, there you go. <laughs> I have an Oscar-nominated superhero movie in my top ten. Not the 10. same one you put in your top ten, mind you, but... I put Logan in my top ten. Oh, I thought you were talking... Didn't you have Thor yeah. Ragnarok and you're like of course I had Thor Ragnarok too? No, that that no, those comments still stay. Yeah, I get those. I can't defend those yet for those people. But for the Oscar nominated Logan, I got that yeah, one up yeah. there. I mean, it's an interesting development. I I know a lot of people have been hoping for years to see some of the super superhero movies like Deadpool break through. Um, but uh, I think Logan no, Logan did, was a crafted. Logan did take like a genuinely interesting step in uh, the like Script, grand though. scheme. Of what uh, superhero movies too? Yeah, but it's the script, and That's it's the fact crazy. that the script. That's crazy. It's the fact that the story went so far out of the realm of what we normally see from superhero yeah. films. I think. Um, and Man. I think, you know, that's why we're not going to see a movie like Wonder Woman break through in these types of categories because it is kind of, it, even though take. it's you know novel in its way, it's not that new in its script. Yeah, so what do you think of all the people who have like really rioted about <laughs> Wonder Woman not being nominated for anything? I think it's, I think it's not. Not really... tell them, tell them. <laughs> Remind I... the people what the Oscars are for. I know what you want to say. Go ahead and tell them. Tell them the difference between Oscar nominations and your favorite movies. I think that they don't know what the Academy Awards are for. I think they don't know what a Best Picture means. I mean, like, the... it, it's seriously like. It's fun. It's it was great while it lasted, but that's not what we're here for. We're here for craft and like the craft, innovators and like the best. Just like like Suicide Squad winning best yes, hair and exactly. makeup, Superman and, and <laughs> We're we're here to honor Suicide Squad and Transformers. Do you know how not hard it's Wonder getting Wonder to defend bullshit. the Oscars? Do you know how hard it's getting to defend the Oscars? And you're the one. <laughs> Who well, they were the good this year, I man. I mean, Get Out got like a shitload of nominations. Jordan Peele and Greta Gerwig in the best director, and and Paul Thomas Anderson, the best director nominees. I mean, like, I'm kind of happy this year with the nominations. Oh, I, more happy than I've been in a while. People still find ways to people will still find ways to complain because Transformers I, last night was a nominated. People always but find ways to. Co I mean, did, did you? Another thing that I thought was interesting that I wanted to point out is that there are some interesting shifts happening in the uh, way that we've seen the nominations been given out before. Uh, it's the first time in a long time that two of the Best Actor nominees were still in their 20s. Both Chalamet and Kaluuya are still in their 20s. Oh, that's right. I keep, for I keep forgetting. Uh, he in, got nominated. That's right? insane. Yeah. Um, and best, best Editing, I believe, has always had at least four Best Picture nominees in it for the last, like, 20 years or something like that. This year, there are two movies in Best Editing that were not nominated for Best Picture. Which uh, ones? Including Baby Driver. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, um, that's right. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's just interesting to see some of these changes in the perception of the Academy. Uh, some of these maybe loosening of uh, what we thought were steadfast rules, like superhero movies don't get nominated, young actors don't get nominated. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, I think we have a pretty interesting crop of nominees i'm not really too upset about i think it's interesting any of the snubs yeah it is it's a really really good year even for the ones where you're just like what the heck is this there will always be snubs because snubs just means that your favorite didn't get nominated uh 
it still remains your favorite though, and you can watch it all you want. Uh, exactly. That being said, it's whoever wins though. I remember we all thought Stallone was going to win it. Right. Yeah. And it didn't happen. No one was and, complaining well, about the nomination. What do you think, though? They do were you complaining think that, about the win. Do you think that Three Billboards now is kind of like on its way out? Do you think that The Shape of Water is the favorite with its 13 nominations? I hope so, because that's my <laughs> uncle and I'll be invited to the barbecue. <laughs> but I don't know. It could be. I think it's between those two. Uh, are, you, are you just completely losing hope for Call Me By Your Name? Um, I mean, I kind of feel like Call Me By Your Name at this point, it's kind of just like, it's happy to be there. I think maybe Chalamet has a chance. You know, where I, you know what I've gotten at? I'm that dude who doesn't root for a basketball team. I root for the basketball player. I've yeah. gotten to the point where I really don't care who wins best picture. I really don't for whatever reason. Like, I'm rooting for something, but I, I care more about the individual. Like you I've been rooting Timmy. not for a picture. I've been rooting. I've been rooting for Timmy. I've been rooting for that best editing for um, Baby Driver. Yeah. I've been rooting for Blade Runner to lose everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've been. That's that's what I've been. I want the individual awards, I guess, more than the collective one because I right. don't feel that whatever wins is really going to define my year. But I do know that whatever individuals win, it can propel them to the next level. Right. And that, so for me, is why I'm kind of excited to see Get Out in so many of these categories. I'd really love to see Jordan Peele go Get home with out. an Oscar, whether it's for the screenplay or director Blum or picture. House any of nominated. Them. Holy smokes. It, it's just so cool that it actually made it. I mean, and I think it deserves it. You know, it was the movie that dominated <laughs> conversation this year. So, for me, I, I just think oh. it's... I think it's nice to see a relatively positive response online to Oscar nominations for movies like Get Out, The Shape of Water, mm -hmm. and Lady Bird that are so popular with so many film fans and doing so well at the nominations. It might make for a more positive discussion of these awards as we move into the 90th Academy Awards, and we'll get more into that on future weeks of the show, uh, but we should move on, wrap up our... Uh, our show for this week. Let Art get to bed because he's out in Sundance and it is getting late. Uh, I can't leave y'all without a pick for the week, though. Art, I know you've been watching a lot of Sundance movies. Do you have anything to recommend for people out there? <laughs> From Sundance or anything? For anything. I'll I mean, give you this I don't one. think most people can see the Sundance movies. So. Well, there well, is there one is Sundance one. movie that you can see, so my recommendation, even though it may not be the best at Sundance, is that you, too, can get a part of this Salt Lake City experience right at home on Netflix. You can go to Netflix and you can watch a futile and stupid gesture. Or is it a stupid and futile gesture? Whatever it is, it's on Netflix. Uh, it, I, you, both of, uh, both of us, are big fans of uh, Mike White? No, it's not Mike White. What? No, no, no. Uh, David Wayne. David Wayne. Why am I thinking Mike White? He's, he wrote School of Rock. Like, we like their movies, so oh, yeah. this is like their untitled, unmastered release. <laughs> yeah, this is I don't want to like say that because it's still very well edited and edges, crafted. Maybe? Yes, right? So for us, it's sort of like, we'll accept you because we love you. <laughs> but y'all really I mean, like, I do think it's harder than people give it credit for to make a consistently entertaining funny movie that communicates a story and this movie does that even if it takes some like strange narrative decisions <laughs> this they did not care in this one they really did not care in this one no. which is is commendable to a certain degree and i have to watch it again i'll probably watch it again on the plane mm -hmm. but there are some they went anti tribeca like some full Angie Tribeca jokes in this thing. Yes. I was like, yo, okay, we're going there. And I, I mean, guess it's, it's weird because it's a true story. That's why. I, I mean, think that's me, what made it so weird. I'd say, I'd say, like, come for, like, the loosely told true story of the founding of National Lampoon, one of the mm -hmm. most influential humor institutions. Movies and everything, yeah. Uh, here in America. And stay for Joel McHale's Chevy Chase pratfall impressions. Bro, whoever they got to play Bill Murray... <laughs> this is the same casting director who got uh, the Snoop Dogg <laughs> got Lakeith to play Snoop Dogg yeah. in Straight Outta Compton yeah it uh, wasn't exactly perfect always but some of them are pretty funny the Joel McHale one is pretty funny that's, that's some good bits that's why I say recommend it if you wanted to say that you saw a bit of Sundance early uh, well this one got released early it got released during the festival it's at home So yeah it's up on Netflix now also up on Netflix now my pick for the week it's called The End of the Effing World. I've only seen the first four oh. out of these eight episodes. 
Uh, this is a co-production between Netflix and Channel 4 in the UK. It aired on Channel 4 a couple months ago. Yep. But it's a really cool, fun, you dig it? teen road comedy kind of thing. Uh, you haven't seen this one yet? You do, I binged it uh, right before I came to uh, came to Sundance. Oh wow! Uh, so I you're ahead of me on this. Yeah, yeah, dude. I, for the first time, yeah, on a TV series, I usually I'm the slowest one, but this one feels like a, it's based off a comic. Reads like well, a com- feels like a comic. It feels like a comic. Well, the you got those super so short, short, eighteen minute episodes, bro. I I thought I was still in the same episode. I was episode three. I said, what? What the? Heck? Right. Yeah, it like does that. kind of feel almost like one overly long indie movie rather than an eight episode mini series kind of thing mm-hmm. uh, I highly recommend it I think it's really great I'm not a big fan yes. of them trying to push a season two yeah that's what I've been hearing um, yeah. I haven't gotten to the end so I can't speak on that but it does seem exactly. like it's a really it, fun it contained package uh, it's yeah. the story of these two young teenagers who think they're a little bit crazy and they go on the run and it's got these really great internal monologues it, it's just very funny in the back and forth and the awkward interactions. So uh, I think that anybody who a uh, loves a good, like, awkward teen comedy will find something to enjoy in the end and of the dark. epic world on Netflix. It's yes, dope. it's very dark. It, you have to maybe be willing to deal with a bit of blood, more blood than you see mm-hmm. in most comedies. True. All right, so uh, those are our picks for the week, but that's all for this week's show. You can catch more from me, Zach Shevich, by following me on Twitter, at ZShevich, as well as on Instagram, also at ZShevich. And check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Multiplex Show. Uh, Art, where can people find more from you? You can follow me in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> I'll be posted up here for Out on the eight streets. days. <laughs> uh, no, you can find me at the A to Z Show on Facebook, Ski Twitter, life. Instagram. <laughs> And uh, Letterbox, which I've been trying to update. I got my list up there for my Sundance movie. So if you if you want to experience Sundance the way that most Sundance seers experience it as well, just going in blank, but you want to you know know what's good and trust my opinion. Top the, the top six that I have six. I know it's weird. It's not five. It's six. <laughs> the first six that you see, those I highly recommend go in there once they come up to keep an eye out for them and let me know what you think and you can tweet at me or facebook me at the a to z show and you can follow me uh, also on youtube where i'll be posting up not only a rundown of my tops and why but also uh, a sort of top the the five tips on how to go to sundance because a lot of people have been asking me it's like yo how do i make it out to sundance and there are ways that you can and if you do and if you follow these tips on my list um Join Zach and I because I think we we both will be going next year, hopefully, and uh, it'd be great to see more people here. It'd be dope. Yeah, uh, because maybe I, a I, bit I've of said spoiler it. Spoiler alert for uh, Intercut 2019. Hey, hey, hey for, for Intercut episode 54. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, Sundance is that place that I hope uh, every film fan gets a film fan gets the chance to visit at least once. So I'll be awesome. making videos about that and hoping to uh, see you guys there in the future. Awesome. Well, you can listen to every episode of the Intercut Podcast on iTunes or SoundCloud. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find new episodes dropping every Tuesday. Also, like our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, all at at Intercut Pod for updates from us throughout the week. Thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, remember... Sundance 2019. We're we're meeting up. Inner cuties. All in one place. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna take it by storm. Yeah. <laughs>